Okay, welcome to the Investigative Journal on this September 4th, 2015 day on our calendar. I'm your host, Greg Anthony, and you're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. And you can listen to my show, if you so choose to, every evening from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. That's Pacific Time on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. I'll also give you a list of a number of uh, AM stations uh, that will be uh, broadcasting selected shows that I do, as well as uh, <clears throat> a couple shortwave stations. And uh, today it's Friday, okay? And uh, I like to recap the week every Friday. And um, we talked uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. Regard, uh, no, make that Wednesday and Thursday. I had two members of the Alamo Ministry on. And that story has been close to my heart. I've covered it for years, ever since, so oh good, 2005 or 2006, when I happened to run across uh, Pastor Tony Alamo, who now sits in jail for 175 years, for basically criticizing uh, the Vatican and teaching uh, Bible prophecy the way the uh, Reformers did back during the time of the Inquisition. And uh, I see a modern-day Inquisition, and this church, uh, this Christian organization, uh, was a target. And uh, I always said this a long time ago, that uh, ever since I uh, started researching the Vatican, that they do rule the world. And uh, it's kind of like, uh, take a little... Uh, Globe. I don't even think the Earth is a globe, by the way. Uh, there's a good chance it's not. It just depends on uh, how much you want to research that subject. But uh, they got the world in uh, their hands, and uh, the Pope will be here to kind of like squeeze us out starting September 23rd. So let's get ready for it, and uh, we'll do a number of shows regarding that subject. But today I have a couple other things planned. Regarding the, so Wednesday, Thursday, I spent time on uh, the Alamo ministry, and uh, if you go back to a lot of my shows, you will see uh, how that story really tells you what happens if you try to tell the truth about this organization from Rome and how they work together with political leaders. Now, how they do that is through concordats uh, throughout the world. There's over two, I think over 200 now, uh, concordats with countries, and uh to me, it shows this is not just a spiritual organization. And when you start really looking closely at it, it isn't. So Tony was right on in his teachings. And these last two shows really show you what he was saying back in the 80s regarding this organization and why they targeted this ministry, which became quite successful. Uh, and when I mean that, I mean you have a number of people uh, that were preaching this message, sending it all over the world. And uh, I happened to run into them because I, I was looking for people in America who understood a little bit about the Vatican and I found out that uh, Tony and uh, understood a lot more than just a little and um, a number of the people that I had researched uh, one father Alberto Rivera had already spoken at his ministry when he was exiled here in America after uh, he came out and told the truth about the Jesuit order so go to those two shows and you'll see how freedom of religion and freedom of the press has been taken away, and I'm going to continue with a few more shows. Uh, you know, I'll try. I'll do it every week to remind you uh, what's coming, and especially on this September 23rd, 2015. But let's move on because I have a couple. Uh, I want to go back to what I did Monday, and that was presenting you some information from a presentation called "The Vatican War and the French Revolution." I also have some information I want to pass forth uh, from a. Another presentation I found uh, called 9-11, The Vatican Rules the World, and there's a bit in there I want to play for you which uh, really gets to the point about the Vatican finances. Uh, that's how I began to understand who they were. So let's, uh, let's really go back. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about how we get information today. And this came up uh, just last night, and I want to bring this to you because it's really important because in the age we live in, uh, our information is coming from sources we have no idea who they are, what they're saying, and uh, basically it becomes kind of like, uh, if you're looking at it from a strictly illegal point of view, it's hearsay. 
you don't know that we're getting our information off of a computer screen and even our research starts there now now let me explain what I what I mean by this uh, I'm not saying it's wrong you know there's anything wrong with getting your information this way but once you start doing this you have to change how you view things uh, and what I mean by that is as a journalist I'm gonna go back and tell you what it was like before the internet because I happen to start out that way and what that meant was that uh, usually as a journalist you're gonna be uh, tackling a story no matter how big or small and you're going to run into people and you're actually gonna see their eyes you're actually gonna talk to them you're actually gonna get to know them and in a sense one person may say one thing about the subject and one person may say another okay you have two competing ideas which uh, basically uh, you might want to say well one is telling the truth both are telling the truth and none are telling the truth so you have a lot of different decisions to make but what you can do for your reader is sort out this information and present it all so that the reader or the listener I found more people back when I started got their information by reading uh, now it's completely changed most people get their information uh, by looking and listening to a computer screen. Now you can do a lot of good research on the internet, but there's one thing you're not going to be able to do, and that's not you're not going to be able to meet really the people who are giving you this information. So it leaves a whole gap as far as who are you going to really trust. And I think it boils down to having to trust yourself when it comes to this information so you have to get better at sorting out what's good and what isn't and I think as a journalist my role has always been that way and I've tried to do that on my shows now for example I recently covered a story regarding there's many people out there who are now going back looking at the earth and saying no no wait a second Nassau is lying and the, the earth is not the way they say and the solar system and all this stuff isn't all right, let's uh, let's look at that. And do you can do as much research as you want, and you're going to find people out there giving you one side of the story, those giving you another. It is up to you to figure out what do you think. Is the Earth round, as they say it is? Is it a sphere, or is it flat? Is it a is it a circle? And what is really going on? So you got you can get the basics. But you're going to have to make up your mind, which makes it really difficult these days because there's so much information and you don't really know who to trust. Now, majority of people are going to trust the big boys. They're going to trust those who have been given the dollars, who have been given all of the money and all of the power to lead you by the nose. Now, what I'm saying is not only could that be a mistake, as a journalist, I have come to the conclusion after starting out without any kind of internet without anything going into libraries reading books actually sitting in Rome talking to a lot of different people on both sides of the coin of the Vatican I've come to the conclusion I don't believe a word that comes out of that organization's mouth and I don't believe much anything that comes out of the government's mouth of, mo of most all countries because I find that most of their information is used to control you they're your owners they want you to be non-thinking people and to believe whatever they say now in every area we look at whether it be medicine whether it be uh, astronomy whether it be finances whether it be political discussions war we find the same culprits controlling us and so I think it's obvious that when you begin to pin the tail on the Vatican donkey you're going to have people who are going to protect that organization and they do it in many different ways one they'll have people who basically talk against uh, what you say they will say you're absolutely crazy the Vatican has no money. It is a poor organization. Very poor. 
It is now here to help you to bring truth, freedom, and to bring a kind of sense of unity in the world. That's what you're going to hear from, you know, people on the on the pulpit. You're going to hear that from political leaders. You're going to hear that uh, from even. In the past, some alternative broadcasters like Alex Jones, who had said the same basic thing. The Vatican has changed. They're very poor. Now he's changing his tune because he wants to point out that the Illuminati, under the control of this pope, is the evildoer. And there's a good side to the Vatican. Well, he's been given his marching orders to say that. I have a feeling. Now, I say it a long time ago. I don't really care. I talk to him any day of the week, and you have to understand that you're going to be dealing with all different kinds of deception in this age of deception and the internet is the perfect place to produce it so to the people that say the Vatican is poor let's look at some other information uh, in this uh, presentation called the Vatican rules the world now I think I queued it up right but if it you have to listen to a minute or two that have nothing to do with their finances bear with me uh, it comes from um, a YouTube called Wake Up, Who Profits After 9-11. The Vatican rules the world, and we have the uh, anniversary of 9-11 coming up. Uh, so let's listen a bit to this. The idea that the United States committed these and other horrific crimes against humanity and participated in the 9-1-1 incineration of thousands of its own citizens is too frightening a thought for many to consider. But even more frightening, are the consequences of denial. Did the world wars, revolutions, and big events of human history evolve naturally, or were they calculated and pre-planned? If they were pre-planned, who planned them, and what are they planning for the future of humanity? The answer to this puzzling question can be found within the boundaries of three of the world's most powerful cities. Those three cities belong to no nation and pay no taxes. They are Washington's District of Columbia, which is not part of the city of Washington or of the United States, the inner city of London, which is not part of London or England, and Vatican City, which is not part of Rome or Italy. These cities, called city-states, have their own independent flag, their own separate laws, and their own separate identity. Vatican City is in fact a state, the smallest principality in the world. It lies on the banks of the Tiber, completely surrounded by the city of Rome. Its status as a separate state emerged from the Lateran Agreements of February 1929. It has its own newspaper postal service, radio and television station, its own flag, and a population of about 1,000. The Vatican also has its own army of Swiss guards, and it even has its own prison. Gracing the walls of St. Peter's Basilica is the Vatican-approved image of God, an angry bearded man in the sky painted by Michelangelo. Sinners who disobey God's list of thou shalt nots risk incurring his wrath and damnation and burning in Satan's eternal hellfire. Cruel and violent images of God's tortured son suffering, bleeding, and dying with thorns gouged through his skull and nails pounded through his feet and hands are on display throughout the Vatican. These images serve as reminders that God allowed his son to be tortured and killed to save the souls of human beings who are all born sinners. These explanations and scary images are especially difficult for children to comprehend. The Vatican rules over approximately 2 billion of the world's 6.1 billion people. The colossal wealth of the Vatican includes enormous investments with the Rothschilds in Britain, France, and the USA, and with giant oil and weapons corporations like Shell and General Electric. The Vatican solid gold bullion worth billions is stored with the Rothschild-controlled Bank of England and the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank.
The Catholic Church is the biggest financial power, wealth accumulator, and property owner in existence, possessing more material wealth than any bank, corporation, giant trust, or government anywhere on the globe. So with that in mind, uh, I'm back here to make a comment. It's easy to see why rulers of the world want to work together with them. What a nice partnership. Bring the spiritual, wealthiest organization in the world, hiding behind Christianity, using Christianity and Jesus as a cover, when in fact they're a pagan organization, and put this onto the people, the two billion strong that they've misled. And what do you got? You got the, you got the beginning of this new world order, this unity behind lies. And that's what September 23rd is all about. Because finally, the United States of America, this supposed Christian country, this country that is supposedly has a constitution to separate church and state and allow those to worship in the manner that they choose, is becoming a country of fascism. Because they're inviting within the halls of our own Congress, a Pope, who is a Jesuit to begin with, if you look into their sordid past, as well as their, uh, if you look at the Jesuit oath, you will find that they're outside of the Jesuit oath, which means killing heretics, anyone that doesn't follow the Catholic Church. They also say that their government of choice is fascism. Let's uh, listen a little bit more. The Pope, who is the visible ruler of this colossal global wealth, is one of the richest men on earth. While two-thirds of the world earns less than two dollars a day, and one-fifth of the world is underfed or starving to death, the Vatican hoards the world's wealth, profits from it on the stock market, and at the same time preaches about giving. And, if I may add something, the Pope is going to come and tell us that he wants a distribution of wealth, that we are people that are too wealthy. We are ruining the world. What a bunch of double talk when you really understand who has all the wealth. Now, I would think that if he, you know, puts his money, his money where his mouth is, he would like to distribute his wealth to the world, which I think would alleviate a lot of the problems. Back to this little presentation. How did the Pope and Vatican accumulate all that wealth over the millennium? One method was to put a price tag on sin. Many bishops and popes actively marketed guilt, sin, and fear for profit by selling indulgences. Worshippers were encouraged to prepay for sins they hadn't yet committed and get pardoned ahead of time. Those who didn't pay up risked eternal damnation in Satan's oven. Pope Leo X rebuilt St. Peter's Basilica, selling tickets out of hell and tickets to heaven. During the Dark Ages, the Catholic Church not only hoarded the wealth they collected from the poor, but hoarded knowledge. They kept the masses ignorant and in the dark by denying them a basic education. And do you think that anything has changed? Let me tell you, when I was in Rome, and I spent six or seven years there, one of the places I wanted to visit and to enter was the Vatican Library. It's, it's an incredible place that's guarded more, you know, it's guarded more closely than Fort Knox. And a lot of the information that we would like to know is still hoarded by the Vatican. And then read, you know, <laughs> the, the history is given to us in kind of a whitewashed way. Just as the truth about even the world we live in today is hidden from us. The controllers do not want thinking people. And that's what the Pope's coming here for, to make sure that there aren't too many free thinkers in this country that may kind of upset the apple cart and this new world order they have planned, which is really, really a highway to hell. Back to this little presentation. <laughs> Oh, 
than 60,000 armed Christians were on their way to reclaim Jerusalem from the infidel. More than 60,000 armed Christians were on their way to reclaim Jerusalem from the infidel. Between 1095 and 1291 AD, the Pope launched seven bloodbaths called the Christian Crusades, torturing, burning, beheading, and mass murdering hundreds of thousands of Muslims and Jews in the name of God. The Pope's brutal soldiers were called Knights Templar, or Knights of the Temple of Solomon, and evolved into today's secretive brotherhood called the Freemasons. Between 1450 and 1700 AD, the Catholic Church followed up their holy terror with the Inquisition. Based on rumors of practicing witchcraft, the Catholic Church hunted down, tortured, and burned alive millions of innocent women at the stake. War II, the Vatican was criticized for supporting Hitler and his Nazi regime. To this day, the Vatican is still under investigation for plundering Nazi gold from the Swiss bank accounts of Jewish Holocaust victims. Over the past five decades, more than 1,500 priests and bishops have been identified in the sexual assault of tens of thousands of boys and girls in their trusting congregations and orphanages. Why is this filthy rich institution preaching spiritual values of poverty and chastity while cardinals, bishops, and priests cover up their crimes of sexual abuse? I think that's a question you ought to ask yourself or ask the Pope when he comes here. And you'll get some double talk. But if you haven't seen by now what's going on in the world as far as the, uh, the truth behind this organization, you will never, ever get to the truth. Why has the church fought and resisted the compensation claims of their sexually, emotionally, and spiritually traumatized victims? Like Vatican City, London's inner city is also a privately owned corporation or city-state, located right smack in the heart of Greater London. It became a sovereign state in 1694 when King William III of Orange privatized and turned the Bank of England over to the bankers. By 1812, Nathan Rothschild crashed the English stock market and scammed control of the Bank of England. Today, Okay, let's leave it there. we only got about 30 seconds in this half hour. I'm going to come back to that. But you're going to see that this unholy trinity, Washington, D.C., uh, the Vatican, and uh, London, these three cities within a city that uh, form this triumvirate, they even have their own one flag that depicts all three of them. So they all work together. And haven't people really asked why? Well, we're going to hit those questions when we come back on the Investigative Journal. And you may uh, find it interesting that uh, this is the really the hub. This, these three places are the hub of the New World Order. Back in three minutes. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. 
if you believe in any of these we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis as if giving a tithe for missionary radio these programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our listen and schedule pages on the internet then when you subscribe we will send you the last quarterly mp3 cd of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter we will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs we're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our God and Creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening since the beginning of time kings have sought it nations have fought for it it has been traded it has been borrowed it has been purchased it has been stolen there's a reason for it to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity invest with the security of gold and silver call discount gold and silver trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit discountgoldandsilvertrading.net listen to financial survival with your host melody cedarstrom right here on firstamendmentradio.com at 4 p.m eastern or 1 p.m pacific time visit discountgoldandsilvertrading.net or call discount gold and silver trading at 1-800-375-4188 toll free 1-800-375-4188 okay welcome back to the investigative journal and this is the second half hour on this friday and we're going to continue with this presentation called who profits uh, the vatican does rule the world and um, like I said, you're going to have to really think for yourself in this age of deception. And um, because it's, all this information is coming at you from all areas. And uh, many people, there's a lot of disinformation people out there working for the uh, upcoming or the New World Order uh, as we know it today when we discuss the truth about it here on this show. So you're going to have to figure that out for yourself. Look, I've dealt with these people all along. And um, the more I do it, the better I get at deciding or discovering, uh, you know, who these people really are. However, I don't engage in any kind of arguments with them. Uh, what I try to do is to just basically tell you that there are people who understand uh, both sides of the coin, and they have chosen to work with the Vatican and their minions around the world. Others are trying to get to the truth, and you're going to have to sort that out for yourself when you go through information. And this, this uh, presentation I'm showing you uh, basically flies in the face of what you're going to be told by many people. So make up your own mind. Let's get back to it. The financial power center and the wealthiest square mile on the face of the earth. It houses the Rothschild Control Bank of England, Lloyds of London, the London Stock Exchange, all British banks, the branch offices of 385 foreign banks, and 70 U.S. banks. It has its own courts, its own laws, its own flag, and its own police force. It's not part of Greater London or England or the British Commonwealth and pays no taxes. The city-state of London houses Fleet Street's newspaper and publishing monopolies. It is also the headquarters for worldwide English Freemasonry and headquarters for the worldwide money cartel known as the Crown. Contrary to popular belief, the Crown is not the royal family or the British monarch. The Crown is the private corporate city-state of London. It has a council of 12 members who rule the corporation under a mayor called the Lord Mayor. The Lord Mayor and his 12-member council serve as proxies or representatives who sit in for 13 of the world's wealthiest, most powerful banking families. This ring of 13 ruling families includes the Rothschild family, the Warburg family, the Oppenheimer family, and the Schiff family. 
These families and their descendants run the Crown Corporation of London. The Crown Corporation holds the title to worldwide Crown land in Crown colonies like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. The British Parliament and the British Prime Minister serve as a public front for the hidden power of these ruling Crown families. Like the city-state of London and the Vatican, a third city-state was officially created in 1982. That city-state is called the District of Columbia and is located on 10 square miles of land in the heart of Washington. The District of Columbia flies its own flag and has its own independent constitution. Although geographically separate, the city-states of London, the Vatican, and the District of Columbia are one interlocking empire called Empire of the City. The flag of Washington's District of Columbia has three red stars, one for each city-state in the three-city empire. This corporate empire of three city-states controls the world economically through London's inner city, militarily through the District of Columbia, and spiritually through the Vatican. The Constitution for the District of Columbia operates under a tyrannical Roman law known as Lex Fori, which bears no resemblance to the U.S. Constitution. When Congress so now you're getting the point when we talk about this triumvirate of evil. They, the, listen, they are your owners, and they are going to own your mind, body, and soul. If you don't start understanding the truth, and if you leave out the Vatican, you'll never get there. And this visit coming up on the 23rd is a perfect example of how they're working together not under freedom, not under liberty, not under uh, freedom of religion, nothing of that sort. They're under a triumvirate of evil, controlling your mind, body, and soul in their own manner by deceiving you. And so why do people really wonder that the information you're getting from a lot of people, even those who criticize the Vatican, many of those who criticize the Vatican work for them. They've done that many, many many times over the course of history because their idea is not only to control the money, control what you may believe, but they also want to control information. And the Internet's no exception. So you're going to have to really, really start piecing things together. Now, what do these three organizations have in common as a symbol? They each have an obelisk. And the one in Washington represents freedom, right? You think it does. No. It represents ISIS. It represents a pagan phallic symbol. It represents who they really are. And the same thing goes for Rome and the obelisk in London. Three little areas carved out that have nothing to do with the countries they're in. Ruling over you. Using Christianity, in our case, as a front. That symbol in Washington will show you that if you really research it. Let's get back to this. Past the Act of 1871, it created a separate corporate government for the District of Columbia. This treasonous act allowed the District of Columbia to operate as a corporation outside the original Constitution of the United States and outside of the best interests of American citizens. And that's exactly... That's exactly what happened. And, um, you know, I'm glad I, I'm glad I brought that to you, uh, the triumvirate of evil. Think about it. Now let's get back to the Vatican War, a little bit of history about this organization that has morphed into uh, basically uh, the new world order today. And annihilate men, women, and children, distort their history, and have weak historians sympathize with her. Let us quote one more source, the 1973 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, Volume 1. It reads, Albigenses, the name derived from the city of Albi of, and listen to the language, heretical sect in southern France in the 12th and 13th centuries against which a crusade was launched. And what we're doing is going back to the Vatican War and the French Revolution, a presentation done by a group called the End Times Prophecy. And uh, they're discussing, the. Uh, this is what it says about the Albigenses who were wiped out 
because of their belief, similar to the way the Alamo ministry is being wiped out today. And uh, they're called heretics. And that's basically what you're called if you don't follow the Pope on September 23rd. Quote online. Though the papacy crushed this apostolic revival, a couple of centuries later, another one was to emerge in the 16th century. France, unbeknownst to many, had one of the greatest impacts on the Reformation through one of its finest intellects. The history of the Huguenots, the name given to French Protestants, are recorded in these books. This monument, known as the Reformation Wall, or the International Monument to the Reformation, in Geneva, Switzerland, has in the centre John Calvin and his protégé Theodore Beza, two Frenchmen. It was constructed in the grounds of the University of Geneva, which was founded by John Calvin. John Calvin was the most influential of all the reformers and the most successful, having more influence in the English-speaking world than in his native France. His theology, based upon a thorough knowledge of the scriptures, a thus saith the Lord, was biblical rather than ritualistic or scholastic. When the Puritans left Plymouth in England in 1620, Okay, let me uh, let me get back to this. I think I just hit the button that took this off, and uh, we're, they were talking about Calvin. You're also going to have to do some, uh, you know, study of history yourself and piece out uh, who were these reformers, and uh, were some of them actually working for the Vatican to create this? It's an interesting uh, subject, and one uh, that you're going to have to research on your own. Uh, let me just see if I can get back to this uh, presentation called The Vatican War and the French Revolution, as I'm typing. And here we go. I think I'll find it. Yes, I, I think I did here. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Let's get back to it. In the English speaking world than in his native France. His theology, based upon a thorough knowledge of the scriptures, a thus saith the Lord, was biblical rather than ritualistic or scholastic. Max. When the Puritans left Plymouth in England in 1620, Sorry, had to, um, to travel to the say new something world, to my dog. They were all Calvinists in their thinking, their theology, and their strict, straight cut living. And unbeknownst to the citizens of the United States, its moral fiber is based on Calvinistic theology. The Scottish reformer John Knox, known as the Thundering Scot, who is also on the Reformation War, was also a Calvinist in his strict theology. In England, though William Tyndale's Bible was the fulcrum on which balanced the entire English Reformation, as two authors put it, Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector, who briefly made England a Commonwealth Republic, was a staunch Calvinist. John Milton, Cromwell's Secretary of State and famous poet, was also a Calvinist. And in Bunhyn Fields, in the city of London, is a grave of another 17th century Englishman who was temporarily jailed for his faith, John Bunyan the author of the famous Pilgrim's Progress, another Calvinist. This is how vast his influence was, and Baptists, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, the Huguenots in France, and the Dutch and German Reformed are all Calvinistic. As a reformer, he didn't purge out all of papal teachings. He reintroduced the Augustinian teachings of predestination, once saved, always saved. A dogma that has no scriptural support, though many think that it does. And Michael Servetus, the Spanish theologian, was arrested in Geneva and burnt at the stake for his differing views as a result of Calvin's no-nonsense attitude. John Calvin had a protege in Geneva who, like Calvin, left France and at the age of 40 in 1559, 
Theodore Beza became the first rector of the University of Geneva in Switzerland, which had been founded by Calvin. When one of the three committees were translating the King James Version of the Bible, they were using the codexes of Theodore Beza that he donated to Cambridge University in 1581. Calvin's influence was spreading like a wildfire throughout Europe whose educational institutions were spreading rapidly. But in France, another movement was rising that was designed to crush all the influence of the Protestant Reformation. In the University of Paris, also known as La Sabonne, a Spanish nobleman and former soldier was gathering together a number of men to form a new order to save the papacy of being a past relic. This Spanish Basque name was Don Inigo Lopez de Recald, who was born at the castle of Loyola in Spain. He is better known as Ignatius de Loyola, and this monk soldier in 1534, at the age of 40, was to gather in one of the oldest churches in France a group of men who called themselves the Society of Jesus. The men in black were labelled as the Jesuits by their protestant enemies, either in Germany or in France, but the name which had stigma at first stuck and they wore it as a badge of honour. Ignatius presented his credentials to Pope Paul III in 1540, and they were only meant to exist for a temporary basis, but they were so successful that they continued and were titled the Militi Regimini, the Militant Regiment of the Church, the shock troops of Rome. They took over the Inquisition, and though they produced a number of intellectuals and academic institutions, what they couldn't cope with intelligently, they destroyed. Why doesn't the generation of today know anything about them or European history? The Jesuits have learned to cover their tracks by carefully going into libraries and second-hand bookshops and destroying works that would enlighten anyone of their operations. But I believe that in the end, the truth will conquer. And before we go into France, let us briefly look at Asia. The Jesuits spread all over Asia, especially into Japan, where they infiltrated themselves into the Samurai culture and formed an alliance with one of Japan's dictators, the Shogun Oda Nobunaga. Many of these Jesuits were welcomed into the courts, for they were gifted and skilled at the sciences, but that was a wedge to control the culture in Asia. But many Japanese leaders caught wind of the Jesuit agenda, and they knew it was not to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it was an agenda of papal-led Western imperialism, and many of the Jesuits were massacred in record numbers by the samurai culture of Japan. Today the Jesuits call these men martyrs. But secular writer Avram Manhattan, unlike most secular sympathetic papal apologists, knew exactly why the Japanese beheaded and expelled the Jesuits from their islands, and he gave the true historical account of what really took place. Manhattan said, the Jesuits were determined to plant the spiritual and cultural power of the church in Southeast Asia. And they're doing the same thing here, my friends. And it's best you listen to uh, this little segment. They attempted with varied success to influence the cultural and political top echelons of society. These missionaries found a powerful protector in Nobunga, the military dictator of Japan. Japanese civil rulers began to realize that the Catholic Church was not only a religion but a political power intimately connected with the imperialist expansion of Catholic countries like Portugal, Spain and other Western nations. Whenever Japanese Catholics formed a majority, the Buddhists and members of other local faiths suffered. Not only were they boycotted, but their temples were closed and when not destroyed, were seized and converted into churches. In 1587, Hideyoshi visited Kyushu 
and to his astonishment found that the Catholic community had carried out the most appalling religious persecution. Everywhere he saw the ruins of Buddhist temples and broken Buddhist idols. The Catholics in fact had forcibly attempted to make the whole island of Kyushu totally Catholic. But the Italian Catholic director Martin Scorsese has been working on a project for 10 years, a film called Silence that portrays the Jesuits as martyrs in Japan, due for release in November 2015, and it will star Liam Neeson. I wonder when that's coming out or has it come out. You see what they're doing here? They're going to depict the Jesuits as martyrs in Japan, just like they're going to depict them as martyrs all over the place, when in fact their agenda is killing and taking everything over for this organization, this triumvirate of evil. And we have Hollywood working right with them. And Spider-Man, Andrew Garfield, who, as the English Catholic press confirms, is studying Jesuit books to prepare him for the leading role in this film. This isn't the first time Hollywood has glorified the Jesuits. In the 1986 film, The Mission, the Jesuits are portrayed as peace-loving missionaries. Orchestra, the Jesuits could have subdued the whole continent. So it was that the Indians of the Guarani were brought finally to account to the everlasting mercy of God and to the short lived mercy of man. Let us now go back to France so we can get a clearer picture of what led to the build up of that provoked 18th century revolution in France. Edmund Paris was a French historical philosopher born in Paris into a Roman Catholic family who studied at the University of Paris, the Sorbonne, but he observed history and current events with a balanced eye and dug deeper than other intellectuals. King Henry III of France, known for his large gold earrings, was a moderate who avoided any wars at all costs, who was sympathetic to the Protestant Huguenots in France. He was murdered by a Jesuit assassin, a young Dominican monk, Jacques Clement, because of his alliance with his cousin, Henry of Navarre, the leader of the Huguenots. And remember one thing, when you go back to my, some of my shows or go to the history of Abraham Lincoln, you will see that the Jesuits were, be were behind his killing as well. Henry Navarre, who later became King Henry IV of France, was baptized a Catholic but raised a Protestant. He was very sympathetic to the Protestants having religious liberty in France. And this plaque shows the Edict of Nantes of 1598, which was a decree that gave liberty to the Protestants in France and allowed them to worship freely. The Jesuits were not impressed with Henry's leniency towards the Protestants. And after two failed assassination attempts, a Jesuit assassin, Francois Ravillac, who Wikipedia cleverly calls a Catholic fanatic, committed regicide and killed him. And Edmund Parrish records that he confessed that he had been inspired by the writings of two Spanish Jesuits, Francisco Suarez on the left and Juan de Mariana on the right, who both taught that the murder of heretic tyrants was justified if they conflicted with papal interests and you know something uh we're gonna i'm gonna hold off the rest there's a big huge uh piece here i'd like you to listen to next week on on the french revolution but uh, i have only a couple minutes and i did want to get across one point uh, what you just heard is not is going to happen here as well uh it never changes now we get our information off the internet, like I said, you're going to find that there's even people out there who are going to be criticizing the Jesuits, who have provided history of the Jesuits, who are actually Jesuits. 
And what they're doing is infiltrating those of you looking for the truth. And it's up to you to figure out who they are. And I've been dealing with this subject for years and have come to the conclusion uh, that it's useless to pinpoint names. You're going to have to just decide on information. Remember, they will, the Jesuits, take on any role, just like they did in Japan. They've done the same thing here with Christianity. And a real key is, look out for those information warriors out there, those researchers, who seem to give you a lot of information, but in the end, make Christians look like fools because of some of their racist opinions, things like that. And I'm talking about people who write books, people who are out there as journalists, posing as Christians. You've got to figure it out yourself. We'll be back uh, next week with the Investigative Journal. Have a good weekend. Visit CrossTheBorder.org C-R-O-S-S CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. That's CrossTheBorder.org I know you all want answers and believe me, so do I and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, the Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crossTheBorder.org.